you've been a system engineer, you've been an Azure engineer, you've been an Azure SME, you feel ready, you've done the certification as an Azure architect, you've applied for the role, and now you've landed the interview. So, what can you expect in the Azure Architect interview? I'm going to go through the Azure Architect interview questions and I'll give you some of the answers that I would say and I would like to hear from potential candidates. I've been on both sides of the Azure Architect interview. I've been the interviewer and I've been the interviewee. So I'm going to today go through the questions and answers from both perspectives. But before we get started, if you're interested in all things tech, if you're interested in Microsoft Azure, if you're interested in Microsoft Cloud in general, so 365 and Power Apps and all that sort of thing, subscribe to my channel. I'm always putting videos out there that help people get started in the cloud or get people moving from traditional system engineer roles into more Azure focused roles or more Microsoft 365 roles. Happy to help, love answering questions. I love sharing all my knowledge with people and all the experience that I've had in all my roles. My background as an IT professional, click on the video card above. I don't know if it's gonna be this side, this side, this side. I don't know, one of them will decide later because I don't know which side I'm on right now. But if you're interested, click on the video card and we'll go through all the roles I've had in IT and how I went from a service desk analyst up to an Azure architect, then a principal cloud consultant and now a director. So the Azure architect role itself it's going to be less of an engineer role, so you're not going to be in day-to-day -day Azure uh, engineering and you're not going to be spinning up and spinning down workloads. What you're going to be more than likely doing is designing solutions in Azure. So using the best services for that customer to build services or workloads in that environment. So for an example, if you're working at a managed services provider, you might get a customer that comes and says, we want to migrate our services to Azure. We want to do a basic lift and shift of all our virtual machines in our on-premises VMware environment into Azure. Now, your role should be then to go through, as a, as a good Azure architect, you'll go through the requirements that the customer has and you will make recommendations based on your experience and knowledge in the platform. You might turn around and say that virtual machines are not the best way forward for this customer. You might tell them that they should use SQL servers, SQL PaaS services, or something along those lines. Or you might tell them to replace some virtual machines with some SaaS or PaaS services available in Azure. That's your role, and your role is to design a solution end-to-end. Sometimes you get smaller projects, like we need to move a single application into Azure. So your knowledge that you need to have on all the different Azure services and all the different Azure resources available has to be quite broad and you need to be able to really pick the best solution for the customer and you need to be able to justify that solution as well. You need to be able to give reasons why you think that is the best solution. So first question off the rank, how can I load balance web traffic in Azure? So this question has many different answers or many different possible answers. The real answer that you should be trying to articulate here is that you understand there is different types of load balancers. So Azure has internal load balancers, external load balancers, Azure Traffic Manager, Azure Front Door. You should probably talk about at least two or three of these services and maybe make a recommendation. I would also at this point be quite impressed if a candidate asked me this sort of question. So if they came back to me and they said, what type of web traffic are we actually load balancing? So is it traffic internal? Is it traffic external? How many servers are there? I would be impressed if someone came back with those type of questions because that just shows me that they're trying to make a, a use case for the solution they're going to provide. So if, for example, the traffic that's being load balanced it wants to be load balanced geographically, you might use Azure Traffic Manager. Another potentially good thing to do would be if you could give an example of where you have used it, even if that example might be on-prem. So for example, with Azure Traffic Manager, you might turn around and say, in traditional on-premises environments, we've used Netscalers or GSLB services to load balance traffic geographically, but in Azure, we will do it with a Azure Traffic Manager. Now, that might be a good idea if you're, especially if you have a lot of experience in on-premises world, if you can articulate that to the interviewer, it might be a good idea to try and show them the experience you have in both sides as well, because you'll be getting a lot of customers that have environments both on-prem and in Azure, or they're on-prem and they're moving to Azure. What is considered good practice when we're talking about network designs in Azure? So it's very easy for customers and organizations and engineers and sometimes less experienced Azure architects to design what they think is a good network in Azure. 
But often what we see is that these networks are actually quite flat. So we see networks that are just a, maybe a single VNet or a couple of VNets or something like that. And those VNets are, are linked together and that's considered the, the, the solution in their Azure environment. While this is good for some organizations, if you're working in a managed service provider or in a large organization, or if you're in an interview where you're going to become an Azure architect, you really need to understand the bigger solutions because if someone needs an Azure architect, they're probably not a small shop. When we're talking about network design, we need to be a bit more detailed. For example, the way that we do Azure networks or the way that we would design a new Azure network is that we will always suggest that the customer does a hub and spoke sort of topology. So we generally have a firewall sitting in the hub and then we have VNets off, off that hub that are peered and they become, they all, and they all route via the firewalls. This, this is probably the best way because then you can have a DMZ, you can have a production, you can have an application and we like to group all the services. So for example, all the shared services will be in their own subnet, all of the DMZ services will be in their own subnet all of the firewall services will be in their own subnet and then we peer it like that. So it ends up being more of a traditional network design, something that you would usually see on-prem, but we replicate it in Azure. And if you actually look at what Microsoft now call good practice, they will always suggest that you do a hub and spoke design. And they will usually recommend that you use an Azure firewall as your firewall, so the native Azure firewall. I think that in the interview you should talk about this Azure firewall and why it can and cannot be a good idea. Give us some examples of some Azure environments that you have designed and have been delivered in your previous roles. So in this question, the interviewer is looking for you to give them examples of what you have designed in the past. So in the past, maybe you have designed some network topology or maybe you have designed a lift and shift maybe you've done an assessment on someone's environment and advised them what type of uh, virtual machines they should replace their on-premises environment with maybe you have deployed an application gateway in the past and maybe you have replaced traditional netscaler services with application gateways maybe you have migrated databases into azure these are the type of things that the interviewer is looking for at this point so if you can talk about the design the overall design you don't have to get into the nitty-gritty how you did this and how you did that you just need to talk about how you designed it so talk about the requirements that you found or the requirements that you looked for from the customer so what type of sla is required by the customer what type of rto and rpo if you're doing a backup service or a dr service what type of SQL IOPS you're looking for. Those are the type of things you should talk about. Talk about the specifics. So talk about how you know, in the design that you put together, you considered topology or you considered IOPS or you considered the general connectivity into that application or that service. Maybe you can talk about how you designed connectivity into Azure. So how did you actually connect your on-premises network into Azure? What did you use? What type of service did you use? What type of connectivity did you use? Talk about those things and just talk about the design and, and maybe some of the considerations that you had for it. Which Azure service can I use to enforce compliance and governance on all Azure resources in a certain subscription or in multiple subscriptions? The answer that the interviewer is looking for is Azure policy. So we can use Azure policy to enforce compliance requirements for organizations. So for example, we have many customers that insist that their data must reside in Australia only or sometimes even one region in Australia. And that's because the data sovereignty requirements of the compliance frameworks that are imposed on them really require them to keep that data in Australia. So in this case, you could give the example of how you used Azure policy to define data sovereignty. Azure policy lets those organizations impose a restriction on all the resources in their Azure subscription or subscriptions to make sure that they can only exist in Australia East, for example. So you create the Azure policy, you'll say that all the resources in this subscription must be in Australia East, and that prevents all sort of Azure engineers, Azure architects, and any or anyone that has contributed access in that subscription from actually creating any resources outside of Australia. What is the suggested method to group Azure resources? So inside Azure, we have these things called resource groups where we put resources inside the groups. So for example, you might have one resource group that has a virtual machine, a network card, a 
disk, a system disk, and potentially some other type of resources. So the question here is, how would you actually group them if you were designing them from scratch? How would you group those resources in resource groups? So there is lots of information about this, including on the Microsoft documentation for Azure's best practices. The short answer is, you should group everything that has the same life cycle together in the same resource group. So for example, if you have an application called application X, and application X has 30 resources, all those resources should live in a single resource group because all those resources share the same life cycle. You can't have one without the other. So you may have the database in that resource group and the application in that resource group and the NIC in that resource group and the traffic manager in that resource group. You should keep all of those in one resource group so if you ever need to move or delete or change something about that resource group, they're all collective and they're all in one. That is the suggested method on how to use resource groups. It does get a bit tricky because when you talk about things like shared services like Active Directory and SCCM and, and things that may be used traditionally in on-prem, you can put them in the same resource group, but they don't necessarily have the same life cycle all of the time. You may decommission one of them, you may keep using one of them, but that is the general best practice. So keep that in mind when giving that answer because I think it's good to elaborate and talk about how sometimes the best practice doesn't always work the best for all organizations. That's something that I've noticed and something many Azure engineers and architects will tell you as well. When we're discussing Azure connectivity, what is the difference between a site-to-site -site VPN and express route. So often some of the first things that organizations want to discuss is connectivity into Azure. How do I get from my on-premises environment, my traditional on-premises environment into Azure? As architects, we need to design this connectivity and we need to take into consideration everything that makes a good solution. So for example, we might need to understand at this point, does the organization have a requirement to actually keep their data off the internet? If they do, then the answer is express route. If they don't, and they really need to keep the budget down, the answer might be VPN. So you might want to reply or answer your interviewer with that sort of example. So you actually need to explain to the interviewer what the actual difference is between site to site VPN and express route, and then explain why the solution might differ between each organization depending on their requirements. This will give the interviewer a really good understanding of how you can differentiate the connectivity, the type of connectivity, and how you can actually think from the customer's perspective and you can consider external environmental factors. So things like compliance requirements or sometimes banking institutions or financial institutions that don't want any of the data on the internet, this might be a very strong requirement. So you really need to consider it in your architecture. The next one that comes up is always costs. How can I keep my Azure service costs under control? So there's many different third party vendors that do this sort of thing. They do cost management in Azure, but really what we need to know is how we can do it natively. Because we generally don't want to sell the customer something extra if there is actually something available inside the Azure subscription for them to use. So Azure cost management is the way to do this. You should talk about things like the Azure advisor, so how you could see all of the cost savings, how you could see the reliability, how you could see what's under provisioned and what's over provisioned. So what they're looking for at this point is they're just looking for you to talk about cost management. So there is actually a management portal called cost management and you can actually view things like Azure costs and you can see what savings are to be had if you do reserved instances. You can see what's under provisioned, you can see what's over provisioned. Generally, we see a lot of organizations that have way over provisioned VMs and they're not using reserved instances on static workloads. There's always recommendations. It's just important that you understand where you can view those recommendations because that's one of the first things that's gonna come up after a few months that a customer has been production in Azure. So we see customers willing to spend a lot of money at first. They're willing to design and they're willing to architect and they're willing to lift and shift. But then shortly after the project's finished, generally there's a lot of tightening because operational costs tend to sprawl a bit, organizations usually come back to us and ask us how they can tighten the controls and how they can actually start saving a bit more money in Azure. 
How can I automate a task in Azure? So there's many different ways that a customer can automate something in Azure. You can use Azure Functions, you can use Azure Logic Apps, you can use um, Azure Automation Accounts with Runbooks, but it's good if you can just talk about one or two of these. So maybe just go back to the interview and talk about something like something that you know very well. So maybe talk about Azure Runbooks, for example. So talk about how you can take all the scheduled tasks on-prem and you can put them in a Azure Runbook and you can completely remove the requirement for those scheduled tasks. I think it's a very good idea to start talking about Runbook straight away because a lot of customers have these scheduled tasks already and they really want to get rid of them because number one, they're a bit insecure. Number two, they use a whole server just to have some scheduled tasks in some instances. So it's good if they can actually remove that server and not pay for another server, especially if they're doing a lift and shift into Azure and they can actually just utilize a service inside Azure that lets them do it in a serverless sort of fashion. Talk about automation of logic apps. If you've done any sort of logic apps, great experience to have. Maybe you can talk about some sort of logic app that you've created in the past. If you haven't created one, I suggest maybe just do one before an interview. Uh, I, I like to always ask about these sort of things because we get a lot of customers coming to us and saying that they're looking for a certain automation but they don't know how to do it and we always seem to be able to deliver it with a logic app. So think about how you can actually create one maybe in your current organization or maybe do one for fun on the weekend. Um, I like to do those sort of things in my spare time but I know a lot of people don't. All right then, good luck with your interview. I hope I've been somewhat helpful to you. If you uh, think that you have any comments or suggestions, drop them in the comment section below. And if you want to hear about any other roles or if you want to hear about anything else related to M365 or Azure or cloud or just tech roles in general, let me know. We'll make a video about it. Don't forget to hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. And again, good luck with your interview.